Okay, should we uh, get started? I have a little technology problems. They don't like to... That project and this one won't talk together, but, but let's see how we do. Um, so last time we, where I was here, um, we did not, uh, did not finish the HPLC section. So today we're gonna talk about the, the other HPLC detectors uh, other than MS, and then we'll go to, to mass spectrometry or MS. Um, um, you see here, there are different curves. So this is supposed to be from the same system. So if we measure at a specific wavelength for our target compound, we could have something that looks pretty nice and clean and pure. Because if we have a compound that mainly absorbs at 232 nanometers, we could say, ah, oh, well, this looks like a pure compound. But as it's the double bonds and the molecules, come back to that, that, that really absorbs. Um, and so going down to 205, we may only have one, perhaps two conjugated double bonds, whereas up here we probably have three. So now, suddenly our extract doesn't look as clean as we thought. And then we could be... Uh, even worse, because we could take another detector. Because the ultraviolet detector, and that's light, like the cuvette, the spectrophotometer, you have made OD in and measured probably other things. Um, but there are other, and this is a detector that sees a lot of other things. And now suddenly you get many, many peaks. So each detector will kind of tell you not the whole truth, but a part of it. And that's a problem with all these detectors. This is why if you buy a product from Sigma, they will write that how did they assay the purity? They could say, well, the purity is 95% by HPLC UV. It may give sense for them to write that, but it, it, they also that way say, well, you know, if you measured it by another detection technique, you may come up with a different number. So, um, UV detector is a fairly simple thing. And as you can see, if you remember that the old cuvette it has pretty big volume and the low flows in HPLC, that's not a good combination. So, so what is done by the instrument manufacturers is that um, it's coming in here, very, very thin. And you know, the more modern they are, the lower, the smaller the capillaries in this stuff are, that is. And then of course you want a long uh, pass. So you come with some light and a detector. So now here you have a flow. And actually with the flow rate you have, we will actually somehow try that, uh, if you look at the, the how, what's the width of a peak, it should actually fit in with the volume there. So if you have a, a um, let's say a one minute peak, um, it's coming over one minute and uh, you have 0.3 mil a minute, then you want uh, a detector uh, um, a volume of this one to be 0.3 milliliters. That's usually is much lower because we should do very sharp peaks. But you can actually increase sensitivity if you have very slow chromatography by taking a, a flow cell at a different volume. So that's why when you buy an HPLC, they will ask you, you know, how, what kind of flow rates are you going to analyze? And what are your column type, peak width? You know, do you know something about that? And then they will actually choose a flow cell for you. And these are pretty expensive things like 30,000 Danish crowns. So you just don't buy the whole lot of, of, of them. So uh, for secondary metabolite analysis, the best UV detector is a slightly advanced one. So, so instead of sending one wavelength through our cuvette, uh, and this is this one, we can then send many different wavelengths. But there's a problem, that is there's no lamp that can generate a really, really huge array of wavelengths. So, so what is done is generally we have a Wolfram or tungsten lamp here some kind of lens system to make sure light goes the right way. 
And then we actually have another deuterium lamp. But the nice thing about the deuterium lamp is that it's like, there can be glass all over, so you can actually also send light through it. So it would generate light, but there are also other wavelengths can go through the lamp also. Um, so it means that the, uh, uh, this lamp will make much of the visible light, and then the deuterium lamp will make a lot of your um, UV light. And all these systems that work with this dode array system that can make your whole UV spectrum in one go, they, they use a two-lamp principle. It also means that if, when you do your HPLC analysis, it could be you say, well, something looked funny. I don't have much down in UV, or I don't have anything up in the uh, visible range. That could be that only one of your lamps is not working very well or not working at all. Um, then everything is about focusing light. And then what it can do here is it can actually put in a filter. So this is some, some glass with a color built into it. A little bit. So not so you can act, so it can put this one in and see how much light is disappearing. So it can calibrate so it knows, okay, you know, so it can calibrate the whole system. And most HPLCs will have this system. So start of the run, they will calibrate everything so you, you get a flat baseline. Okay, so now all our light is coming through here, and here's actually the cuvette I showed you here. Um, and this one is pretty much just sent to the flow coming out of the column. Um, then all light is coming out. And now you have to go back to physics of high school, that's uh, some years back. And so how do we, how do we, how can we handle light? And it's so that light at different uh, wavelengths, they will spread out on a, on a grating or at a prism. So you can also use a prism system here. So what it does, it sends the wavelength here, the blue or UV wavelength here, and then it spreads them all over here. And then of course it's a matter of having a lot of small, so if you have a lot of small detectors here, then they can each measure a certain wavelength. And that means that you continuously can measure the whole UV spectrum all the time. If you have an old classical spectrophotometer that could only take one wavelength at a time, then you first had to measure, let's say, 200 nanometers, 204, 8, and so on. That takes a long time for scanning UV spectrophotometer. Well, that's not feasible compared with the sharp peaks we get from the HPLC. So the detectors also if you take a very old dode array detector and put it on a brand new HPLC, it may not work because the electronics in this is not very fast. It cannot sample and send the data to the computer fast enough for the chromatography. We will like this one to be able to So we have a So we have time here, so if we have a chromatographic peak, we will like to be able to measure here a number of times, 12 to 20 points over the peak, so we can actually describe the peak. Because if we only, let's say, hit the peak here, and here, and here, and here, we will not have a very nice integration of the peak, and for quantitative analysis, this will, of course, be a problem. So this is how the newest stuff is made out of. That's the newest from, from Magellan. This one has only a UV lamp. So in many of these uh, instrument manufacturers, you can get a only UV lamp system, or you can get one with also a, uh, with a visible lamp in. If you know you're not going to go above 300 or 400 nanometers, you don't need the UV, uh, the Wolfram lamp. And everything now is, is made, you know, in microelectronics. So all this is uh, assembled in a clean room, a clean room facility. Because, of course, you want the very thin tubings here. And we don't want now we, we, we did nice sharp peaks from the HPLC, so 
we do not want big, thin, thick lines here to mix it all up again. So you want a laminar flow setting here, if you recall that if you have that chemical engineering. So you want laminar flow settings here in, measured, and out. And of course, the better you can do this, the better the sensitivities of the instrument. So, I said something about um, what can we see with the UV detector. Because the UV detector is the most common detector, and it's, unless it's uh, on a very, perhaps with a mass spectrometer, you will find an HPLC that does not have a UV detector. But besides that, I would guess the normal steel HPLC is normal pH that can run in the normal pH range. 95, 98% will have a UV detector. And about 50% will probably have a Dota ray, so you can measure the whole wavelength. I think a UV detector is about 80,000, perhaps 60,000 crowns, and getting a Dota ray will be 20, 30,000 Danish crowns on top of that. Um, so you see here that the, the whole trick here with, um, if you have, like see here, we only have one double bond here. So actually, the UV max is below 200 nanometers. Can you, perhaps, can you remember, we talked about solvents and where they were absorbing. So could we see this one with acetone? Acetone absorbed up, up to 330 nanometers. So uh, you will not be able to see this one or this one, but and all this will be away if you use acetone, but we could still see this. It's why we use a citronitrile because it has the lowest UV absorption. If we go to methanol, we're probably going to miss this compound because there you have quite a lot of uh, absorption from the methanol, and, and so you'll have a lot of noise. You also see if we go up, now we have, look at the conjugation. So it has to be every second bond. And it doesn't necessarily need to be a carbon-carbon bond. But now we have two, so now we get a UV max at about two, 200, perhaps 230 nanometers. Um, you also see here, now we got one, two, three, four. So now we are going up in the wavelength. In, a, in the wave number here to see that. And more or less, the more conjugated double bonds we can make, we, we have in the molecule, the higher up it goes. So here you have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. But it has to be every second. So if this one had a double bond here, it wouldn't help. Or double bond here. It should be here or here. You can also see that here we have two isomeric compounds, actually three, and they all have slightly different UV spectra. So if you have reference standards, you can actually use this. This will give you fingerprint information on the compound. Also, what is, what is rather interesting is that Further out you go in the, uh, out here, the less noise you will actually see at your, uh, at your baseline from HPLC. So when I mean, mean noise is that if you ask the computer to give you, let's say, 400 nanometers, you're going to look at your baseline, you're going to look a little bit like this. Let's say this is 0.1 milli absorption, absorption unit. So this is the absorption you know from BS law. So this is just in milli. But if you take this one at 200, now let's say we still have the zero, this is 0.1, <coughs> then You know, this, this may still be 0.1, but 
but this will be your noise level. So it also means that if you want to detect this compound, if it's in a mixture where there are not a lot of similar stuff, because if in a mixture where there's a lot of other stuff, then you would probably ask the computer to do the 438 nanometer chromatogram, because that will probably, because what you want to see is, of course, do, do I have an increased peak that is clearly above, this is, we can call this noise, and then we can call this signal. So in many cases, we, we work with a, something called a signal-to-noise ratio. There we can define if we say, well, I want a signal-to-noise of 3, 5, or 10, before I say I have a peak. So down here, it could be you actually have slightly more signal from this peak. But, and of course, this comes at the exact the same time. Um, but because the noise is much higher, you cannot go and say, I have a positive identification of this peak. Because, you know, it more or less looks like some of the random noise on the baseline. So sometimes, if you work with HPLC, UV, you would, you would actually test the different wavelengths and see where do I have the, you know, where do I get the lowest noise? Also, compare, you know, in the, in, the, in the background sample I have, compared to the signal of my compound. That also means it could change. So if you want to uh, analyze this one in a fermentation broth, where there's perhaps not a lot of other stuff like this, you will wait, take this one. But it could be in another food matrix or something, you may <coughs> take this wavelength or this one. That could be sample dependent because you want to reduce the noise, and if there's a lot of noise on some of the wavelengths, you're not going to choose that. Now, if we get a whole UV spectrum all times, like at any sampling rate you type into your computer, the data we have will be three-dimensional. So here, the color intensity shows us how much absorption we have. And it also means that depending on the wavelength you choose for your chromatogram, you're of course going to get a different chromatogram as you also showed in the, in the first slide. So sometimes to see, do I really overlook stuff, you can on most of these systems get a three-dimensional plot. Where then the color intensity here again shows how much you have. And then of course this is time. So a slice in time will give you the spectrum and another the slice in a given wavelength or a you can say an array of them will, will give you a chromatogram. Yeah. Two in time. So um, what we also have is that we have a uh, Here's a compound, you see it has some phenols, so we can play around with the pH. Um, and they will change charge. And so for a compound that you know, has pH dependency on which form it is, it will also change UV spectrum. So here's this compound's UV spectrum at 10.3, and here's at pH 3. So if you have from a scientific paper a printed UV spectrum of the analyte you're looking at, you have, to, you have to look into what is the pH, if it's a compound that can change form. And of course, with all these phenolics, this one will change. So there will be, as I say, there is a number of different detectors. So the UV is the most common one. There was this something called refractive index I'll come back to. It's a vibrative light scatter and also slightly slow show. And then there are some electrochemical ones. And these can be very, very sensitive. And they're also very selective. So this is, you can do redox to a compound. So here we could measure something like NADPH or stuff like that, like a Q10 stuff, where you can reduce them or oxidize them. Sugars. You can oxidize the aldehyde, 
or you can reduce it. You can also measure the conductivity. How easily, if I put a certain potential on, how much current will run. And there are many more detectors. And they all have their advantages and disadvantages. So here's the light scattering detector. So how many here have done fermentations and had certain the ethanol and certain stuff measured? Nobody has had any of the fermentation courses? There must be. So to measure something like ethanol that has no conjugated double bond, we need a very special detector and this refractive index. So it simply sees how much the uh, this angle is changed. And uh, the nice thing about this detector is it sees everything. And the more or less gives a response compared to the mass of the compound we have. The bad thing is we cannot use it in gradient mode. A lot of applications we cannot use it for now. And it's not very sensitive. So it's not a trace analytical tool, but of course, if we have one or two percent ethanol in our fermentate, we can use this detector. Um, it's non-destructive, but it actually has a very high internal volume. So in hard practice, this is always the last detector if you have a lot of detectors. UV detector does not really spread out the peak much, so you can always have a detector after UV detector. So you will always set first UV and then this one, never the opposite. But it's used, all fermentation labs are more or less known in the world. They have lots of HPLCs with this uh, detector on for measuring ethanol, pyruvate, how much residual sugar do we have, do we have production of uh, organic acids, stuff like that. So now we come to a very different end of the detector array. So like the electrochemical detector, the fluorescence detector is for the compounds you can see, and that's not all compounds. For the compounds we can see with this detector, it is usually very uh, sensitive. So the idea here is that you have your, usually this works on something with some ring systems, so aromatic systems. So if an electron can move up, to, you know, to a certain energy state, they have these states. If it doesn't fall all the way down, so then the, uh, it has absorbed energy and it falls down, doesn't fall all the way, so it means you have to have a lower, higher wavelength because it has a lower energy. And if you recall, there's an opposite proportionality between the wavelength and the energy. And because if it works, because the wavelength can gets differently, it's very easy to sort it out. So because you can send out at one wavelength here, and then you know we have various lenses and mirrors and stuff. It's very easily in optics to 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 remove uh, a light um, of the wavelength. So we can very accurately sort light. It's very easy it's been done for almost hundreds of years. We're good at that. So with, the so with the fluorescence detector, it's a little bit like being at a stadium and then seeing, okay, there's nobody who has a lighter up. So everybody who takes a light up and turns it on, you know, you can see very few if everything is dark. The UV detector and the opposite, it's more or less, everybody more or less has a, have the, uh, have the light up. But, you know, it's very difficult to see if you are 30,000 people and three of them takes down the hand. But the fluorescence is very sensitive and it's because it's very easy. So if you send out 330 nanometers here and then we measure at 400 nanometers, it's very easy. We can very efficiently remove all the 330 nanometer light here. And then we can, so we have a very, very low noise. So it's the same here. Not now our noise. It's just going to be. And then, of course, now we can see 
a tiny peak. So the reason why this detector is efficient, there's actually less signal. You may, because light is absorbed and then it's sent randomly around. So we're going to lose most of the light. So perhaps we only get 10% of the light up here if it's a good fluorescing compound. But if our noise is reduced at 1 million times, then it's, it's worth the effort. So this is also a very common detector, and it's also non-destructive. So we can have an HPLC with a UV detector and then a fluorescence detector, or a fluorescence detector and then a UV detector. And the rule of thumb is that there's a lot of UV absorbing compounds that doesn't fluoresce. So it's about a third of them, very flat structures. Uh, So um, what to do if we have an analyte? We only have a UV fluorescence detectors. How can we analyze compounds that are, for instance, acid aldehyde here? So how can we uh, detect this one? We can simply add a chemical reagent, and now we have a UV absorbing compound. This is called deritization. That can be our only choice. A very elegant detection method and very, very commonly used. It's this one down here. It's a pretty smelly thing. Um, but it's a very, very fast reaction. So um, it's used a lot for amino acid analysis. And the nice thing is this can be done in the... Um, this can be done in the auto sampler. You remember that we auto sampler, we had a lot of precision for vials. So we can simply ask the auto sampler needle, first perhaps go down and pick up some reagent. Then go down to our sample vial, pick up a little bit of our sample. Perhaps go back, take some more of our station agent. Take it up in a coil where it's mixed a little bit. Leave it there for 30 seconds then inject on the column. And that is done routinely. This is how you get the cheapest amino acid analysis today. This one has another uh, beneficial use. This one actually fluoresces a little bit, but it could be a normal uh, aromatic, uh, non-aromatic amino acid. Um, so firstly, we get a very high signal for this. But also for the small ones, now we can retain them on a uh, reverse phase column. So by doing some smart chemistry, we can, we can detect our compound, and now we also, they are easily to do chromatography on. So, so this sterilization is, is used a lot, especially also because you can automize it in the auto sampler. So here's an example of very simple separation of all the amino acids. And the fluorescence detector is also about 100,000 Danish crowns, and it's, um, you know, you change your lamp once every three years. So it's, my lamp is perhaps five, 10,000 crowns. So it's a, um, it's a fairly cheap detector if you look at the, if you have a lot of samples. And of course, with the newest technologies, of course, you can also do this fast. Um, then there is the evaporative light scattering. So now we have what comes out of the column. We have some nitrogen here. And we have a laser. And now we can see if we get small particles in here. So this is the idea. We evaporate stuff and we look for particles. So this is very good for salts. It has a very, very high sensitivity. It has a very high sensitivity towards sugars. Stuff that you kind of look at as crystalline. Whereas if you have a volatile compound like ethanol, it will come through and it just evaporate with your solvent and you're not going to see it. So all detectors will have things they are very good at and they're very, you can see usually very low or 
they can see a lot. Um, this is why we go through at least some of these detectors, because it can be very important to know that each detector you work with will have some limitations. No detector can see everything, quantify, and, and still be selected. We could also use biology. So this is a quite old separation of uh, a fungal extract. You hopefully all know a microtiter plate. So this takes some time, but but you know, this is the UV signal. But uh, if you have a very selective or sensitive biological assay. There could be some cells you want to see cytotoxicity. It could be some, it could actually also be you want to do some kind of enzymatic reaction. Whatever you know is very selective towards your compound or some kind of activity you want to discover, um, we, can, uh, we, can, we can do in the, and we can do in an, uh, a well assay. If everything is small vials, it's gonna be very time consuming for you to work with. So um, the idea is that there's of course a needle, automatic needle, that after the stuff is coming out of the UV detector, there's simply a needle that you know goes to this well, then to this well, and then to this well, and then it moves at these lines where they indicate it. So then if you're interested, then you can if you say my crude extract it's very active, it's very toxic, or whatever kind of activity it has. It is very, uh, actually also if you want to discover an enzyme, you say we have, then of course you need to have some kind of compound that for instance changes color when it meets the enzyme. Then you could technically see uh, do that. So the idea is then you, you separate your things and then you hope, let's say when, at, this time range, then you can see which are all these peak are actually the active ones. And of course, if you're looking for novel compounds, this is the way to go. And it is a very, very time consuming, consuming way to work. Um, so here's actually an assay we work with. Uh, and here, for instance, we had to send this one to Germany. So, um, firstly, they did not like these wells. They did not work. So, um, we also have to make sure our blank, let's say our, actually with some cells, um, it's a pretty big problem that, uh, that, that some plasticizers or some stuff in your lab are toxic to those cells. So, it's very important to have blanks. So, here we have a solvent blanks. Um, we also have some actually HPLC separations where we fractioned more uh, without injecting a sample and also put them in. Here we have our crude extract in different concentrations. So the stuff we put on, we have a different concentration. And then very importantly, because we send it out of house, a lot of stuff can happen. We have actually added a very, very, in this case, very, very toxic compound. It could be any positive control. So you know that, that when you get the uh, answer back, they should, this one should test very highly positive and this one slightly and this one even lower, but still positive. So you can, so you can actually validate that the assay is always working. Of course, this can be done in many different ways compared to the assay you work with and how many fractions you make. In this case, we had a problem because we had more or less loaded too much on the column. So actually in this, so this is how the uh, cells, if they're alive, they can cleave this compound and make a color reaction. So about 100% is no problem. And then you see something happens here. So one pump compound must dilute here. And, um, and not much, but still some toxicity is left here. And then we simply have too many compounds in this case that dilutes here. Uh, so here everything is dead. Um, and of course you can be lucky that you kind of have this and you only have one, one peak. 
but working with natural products, you're starting to look a little bit into biosynthesis, you will see that nature in some cases produce a lot of analogs. In many cases, these analogs will have more or less the same biological activity. So, we have some assignments, and then after that we'll have a break. I hope there's enough here. So here we have a separation, and we have some compounds, and um, which one is which one? Yeah. Oh. 